Hello everyone and welcome to Open Observability Talks. I'm Dotan Horvitz uh, and you are in a podcast brought to you by Logs.io. Uh, if you're new here, Open Observability Talks is a stream and a podcast backed by uh, Logs.io. Uh, and here we talk about anything DevOps, observability and open source. Uh, we typically have a talk uh, or a discussion with experts from the uh, community. And uh, afterwards, we, I'll, I'll have some news and industry updates for you. If you have uh, something interesting that you'd like to share, uh, do feel free to reach out and uh, suggest your topic. Uh, you can find us on uh, uh, Twitter at OpenObserve. Uh, you can reach out to me personally at Horovitz, H-O-R-O-V-I-T-S. Uh, you can find us on the website. Um, uh, openobservability.io and you can also have a designated uh, um, uh, link where you can uh, submit your uh, CFP. If you're on uh, YouTube, you can see that now on the uh, on the screen. So feel free to reach out to us and uh, submit. We're more than happy to have uh, more community members uh, from the industry uh, appearing and sharing on this. Um, and uh, with that, let's move on to today's episode. And today's episode's topic is about how much observability is enough. For today, I'm uh, glad to host uh, uh, dear friend Jujar Singh. Uh, he's a global uh, DevSecOps practice lead uh, at The Economist. And let's add Jujar to the stream. Hey, Jujar, good morning. Hi, Dotson. How are you doing? Great, great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm uh, live from my daughter's bedroom, uh, <laughs> such as uh, such as the nature of the world these days. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm also from the home office, so uh, COVID nineteen situation is still with us, but uh, uh, we're doing fine with that. And uh, maybe you can uh, uh, say a few words. You're joining us from the from the UK. It's uh, important to say. Correct, so, yes. uh, thanks for the early uh, early wake up for us. Um, would you like to uh, maybe present yourself and your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Jajar Singh, uh, at Jajar S13 um, on Twitter. I'm uh, currently global uh, head of, well, global DevSecOps practice lead um, for The Economist. I've been here for three years now um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. My background, actually, so I started in IT when I was 16 in a computer shop fixing computers, right? Windows, installing Windows 95, upgrading hard drives, that kind of thing, right? And um, sort of, um, and now in approaching my 40s. So I've been in IT for basically 24 years. And the first 10 years of my career were in, as an IT manager, so Microsoft certified professional, you got any questions about NetBIOS, um, I'm your man, right? Um, uh, when, you know, MCSE, Active Directory, Exchange, Storage, Server Rooms, that kind of thing, right? Big fat Dell storers and robotic tape arrays. <laughs> um, so, so you know, that, that's where I that, that's where I started. Um, but I always enjoyed software engineering. And at the time, I didn't really understand the difference. And then I kind of peaked in my IT career as IT manager by the age of like 25, 26. It was great. And where do you, where do you go from here, right? Um, and, 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 yeah, it's either become IT manager for bigger and bigger companies. Um, but then I took a, I took a punt, right? And I took a pay cut, I remember. And uh, it was super scary and became a software engineer because it was just, I wanted to give it a try. Uh, best decision I ever made. I just I just absolutely loved it. Um, it's just so much, I find it so much more. I still enjoy the IT side, don't get me wrong. But um, it's just so much more creative as a software engineer. So I'm coding, programming, programming, programming. And then, then cloud comes along. So this is, we're talking 10 years ago now. And uh, well, I know what a hard disk is, and, and I know what a Git repo is. So um, it just kind of, kind of uh, segue together. So I've done stints as um, lead architect, tech lead, um, and uh, currently, yeah, doing doing DevSecOps, and I, and I just love it. I really, really love it. That's what I do. Um, prior to this, I used to work for John Lewis, and my job there, amongst others, was to bring cloud to John Lewis. They had zero cloud. Um, and then we got to, um, I was very fortunate. I, was put, I made the point man for Google Cloud and Google Cloud rolled out the red carpet. I got the red carpet treatment from them. You just go to their office and drink their amazing coffee. They have a coffee lab in the London office in, in uh, Victoria. Um, all sorts of different ways of making coffee and sitting there. Um, 
and that was my first exposure to Kubernetes. I've never done that. So it's about four years ago. And now uh, John Lewis.com is a huge retailer in the UK. And now, you know, they're deploying multiple times. It used to take three, four months to do a deployment to the Oracle infrastructure before. And now, um, thanks to Kubernetes and Google Cloud, they do multiple deployments per day. But that was really interesting from a organizational change point of view. Here's a 120-ish year old organization, right? Um, with similar, uh, the air computers were that old um, and still, still Z series mainframes. But how do you, you know, the technology was easy. How do you convince people that this is the right thing to do, right? Um, so that was super interesting from that perspective. Um, and here at The Economist, I came here. They're already in cloud. They were already bought into the vision. But it was, um, they'd gone to the, what I call the first stage and they'd lift and shifted into cloud. And now how do you build maturity? How do you go into cloud? We've made those savings. Now what's the next um, optimizations? What can we do next? And how do we go to the next stages and evolve to the next stage? So that's what I've been doing for the last three years is taking The Economist through that journey. Yeah, so actually, it's interesting what you said about uh, getting into organizations in a certain point in their maturity and um, understanding of the general DevOps needs. Obviously, this also reflects on observability in particular. So maybe um, can you say a few words from your uh, experience transforming these organizations on how you, what what is the, what are the needs that you identified uh, for observability and how you drove observability in these organizations? Yeah, so so why do let's go back to why do we need observability? What why why is that important first? Let's let's try and answer that. So um observability is the ability to see and monitor the behavior of your systems in, in production, hopefully. Um it doesn't have to be production. And once you have that knowledge and once you have that ability, you can make point in time decisions so debugging we call it right it's fancy you know you need to debug so that's that's one definitely we need observability otherwise we can't debug debugging becomes harder but you can also look at trends you can also optimize and you can also answer questions um not just about your system but how people engage with your systems as well so therefore you can you know have a better customer experience too so um, without observability you can't do those things all those things are very very difficult and you're shooting from the hip right so um, if you want to be data driven first gather the data right and, and that's what observability gives you um, so I'll talk about the economist here is um, and, and actually I won't worry too much about previous organizations but this it's very interesting here because um, we've done the lift and shift into cloud so um, actually, let me, talk, look, let me talk about it in terms of um, capability modeling, right? So I've been working recently very hard on, and maybe you've seen, seen another talk about it, but um, the capability levels, and, and, I, and I simplify it very more, you know, it very much matches organizational maturity levels and level one, two, three, and four. Um, and most of it's based on uh, the book. I'm holding up the, the book Accelerate by Jean Kim, Nicole Forsgreen, and Jez Humble, right? So it's it's an amazing book. And they talk a lot about capability mapping. Um, Maybe we can um, uh, put that on the links to the uh, podcast after yeah, the, you can send it to absolutely. me. Absolutely. It's uh, interesting. And uh, the, view, the listeners couldn't see the book. So uh, if you want to repeat uh, slowly, then that, that's a good uh, good read. To yeah, I'll, I'll send the link. But uh, it's, it's definitely a great read, Accelerate. Um, I think it's also available on Audible too, but it really, really good. You know, I've been doing DevOps for a long time, but these guys, the thing I like about this book, so it's it's all stuff, mostly stuff I've encountered before. There's a few new things, but they've um, they've put the science behind it and the research. Yeah. So you should do trunk-based development because, and then they've got the research to show how it accelerates you. Uh, um, and you should try and avoid, uh, where possible, right? Try and avoid things like Git flow because it slows you down and not having source control at all you know that's the least mature approach so um so if we use that for as an example it's a great it's a get, great segue um so level one or level zero is no source control management level just uploading zip files or copying files directly to the server. it's a level four maturity which is trunk-based development right so uh, and so what i've done here at the economist is try and map out um level one to level four and then plot where all the teams are on that maturity matrix against many things. And observability is one of them. So, the, the, and I'll share the link. So it's just on jajar.com uh, and there's a link to it there. A, and it's open sourced as well. So 
um, MIT license, feel free to fork it and make it your own. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions there. And then you can put a score against your teams and it will plot that in a nice fancy graph that you can use to sell to the C-suite. Um, but so observability. Uh, someone who played with it, I, I highly recommend all the listeners to check it out. A cool project and really, really intuitively uh, to, to map your organization. So uh, if, if I may say with my personal uh, impression, definitely great. Thanks. Thanks. It, it just all you need to do is fork it and modify the JSON. Uh, it's one JSON data blob, big fat blob, and that's it. You can make it your own. So I encourage you to do that. And observability. So I do I do multiple principles. Observability. Uh, these are DevOps principles. Observability, uh, development practices, CICD, security, availability, uh, durability, and then culture as well. It's, it, culture is a bit of a weird one. Just ignore that. But uh, if we talk about observability now, we've got level one observability all the way to level four observability. So level one is you're new into the cloud, you've done lift and shift, and you just moved your workloads into, into cloud. Level four being, uh, I always quote Netflix of this world, right? They, they jokingly say that um, they're an observability company. Oh, and they also serve video, you know. Um, and Netflix will tell you, you know, uh, when a fly flew past the server and, and what gender it was and you know, <laughs> um, which, which, which region it came from. That, that's the level that they, they invest in their own observability. They, they, they're masters of it. Or they seem to be masters. I mean, who knows? You go work for Netflix. <laughs> it would be like every other organization and they have got various technical struggles. But yeah. definitely the, the stuff that they put out is very, very impressive and, and inspiring. So we've got level one, lift and shift, you know, um, and so you've just got, uh, and, and to use AWS, you've got basic CloudWatch metrics. You can tell people how much CPU your service is using, right? So our, our e e-commerce website uses 30% CPU at 12 p.m. That's it. And that's about all the insight you've got into your system, how much disk space you've got left and how much CPU and how much network traffic is coming in and out, all the way to level four, how many transactions are happening, uh, when is peak, what's the saturation, all the, the sort of four golden metrics that, that if you look at the Google, I'll put a link to that as well. Remind me to put a link to that in the show notes. The um, I'll put it in the private chat here for the moment. The, the four golden signals um, that Google talks about, you know, so utilization, saturation, um, rate errors, duration, yeah. What's the other one? Last one is traffic. Traffic. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got full comprehensive mapping of all your systems. You know where the issues are. You can tell issues before they even arise. So you can start to see the symptoms of them bubble up and possibly even respond before it even becomes a problem. And your systems auto heal, um, auto failover, that kind of thing. So there's level four nirvana. Uh, it's a level level one. You're just trying to just trying to get through the day, right? Putting out fires. So um, that's why I've been taking The Economist on this journey um, to get to level one. We're currently, for most teams, are doing level three. Um, we're doing pretty well. We could do, um, and level three is when they start to have multiple overlapping views on system health. And I, and I always find that very important. So um, it's not just, okay, we've got Datadog, we've got a new relic turned on. Um, we've also got a logging platform. There's a famous one here, Logs.io, for example. Um, and Logs.io is telling us this in a slightly different way through the log metrics and, and telling us this. And um, New Relic is telling us this. And, and CloudWatch is telling us this. Um, and where they intersect is where the truth is. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it, I always think it's, it's we say, oh, no, we don't want to overlap. But actually, I think overlap within reason is, is actually a good thing. Um, it helps keep your systems honest. So that's kind of where we are. With the, the economist is starting to get to that stage. Um, and then the next stage after this is, you know, the full SRE um, service level objectives for everything measured all the time, constantly, you know, uh, updated and changed and evolved. So that's, uh, that's where we want to head to. But, but I guess, I guess the, the question that, um, you know, the, the discussion has been going on in the industry and uh, what the, the desired state and the, uh, like the idealistic state is, is fine. But what I would like to understand maybe is the realistic way of, of approaching it because no, not every company needs a Netflix level of observability. We, we all, you know, imagine Netflix or, you know, for DevOps and SRE, we imagine Google and others, but actually not all of us are Googles and Netflixes of the world. And then the questions begs it, 
what is the the minimum observability that we need so we, we don't want to over invest and uh, certainly not to you know over provision so to speak in, in observability uh, if, if you don't actually need that and if you can't uh, prove the, the value so how, how would you estimate or, or approach the question of what is the minimum observability needed for me for my organization for my IT at this point in time I, I think the the sort of the simplest thing that works is, how how often are your systems going down, right? And how quickly do you respond to that? So observability can give you so much more than that. Um, like, you know, we were talking about earlier about how you can enhance your systems, build faster systems, um, more responsive, lower, lower latency, all that kind of stuff. But actually, um, if you want to just start out, um, and this is where we were at The Economist, right? We'd have uh, quite a bit of downtime when I first started. And now um, the systems are very, very... You know, touch wood, <laughs> very very stable. Um, so, uh, I, I would say is you need enough observability to be able to first of all spot errors and quickly find out in your system where in your system those errors are, and then be able to fix them. So that that to me is minimum observability for most organizations, right? Now, if you're if you're an Apache, you know, you're writing software for an Apache gunship or, or heart monitors, you probably need level four, level five, level 10 observability on your systems, right? Um, and again, so it depends on the criticality of it. Whereas if you just, you know, it's just little side project, a uh, little side hustle, and, you know, it's only used during the day, nine to five, you can probably get away with less. Because as, as you rightly point out, observability isn't easy and it isn't cheap. Um, so if you overdo it, uh, you're also then now, and I've been in this stage, right? You've, you've kind of, you've, you've added loads of, you've read all the blog posts, you've got excited, you've added all the Prometheus and you've wired everything up. And then you just, uh, spend most of your time just observing those systems, which is why I no longer host my own logging platform or my own monitoring platforms. <laughs> I outsource that. <laughs> Right. You got to say to your own to your own monitoring tools and observability. Uh, yeah, uh, now who's going to monitor the monitor, right? And it's just like, oh man. So, and I've done that in the past where my my monitoring my internal monitoring systems, just trying to be cheap, uh, have gone down, and then the production system's gone down, but my monitoring system hasn't told me because it's down. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> or, or or I've done uh, like point to point coupling, you know, using TCP or something, and so it's like the monitoring system goes down. Uh, with increased load, there's more log log entries going in, and then uh, the application stops working because it's a blocking call, um, and I've not used a sidecar or, or you know that kind of. So um, yeah, definitely wherever you can um, outsource your your monitoring and your observability. I, I um, also think that it's interesting because you know your your uh, let's say the your software and uh, technological stack also uh, obviously has uh, bears some uh, implications. I think the most extreme uh, impact that we've seen uh, in the recent uh, years was the switch, the migration from monolith to um, microservices. You know, monitoring microservices, uh, at least in my, in my experience, required a much higher level of, of observability than we be, before we needed. And that's obviously microservices together with the way that the, 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 the frequent releases and the granularity and, and the CI CD and so on. So how would you see the, um, uh, the, the, the change or the technological stack and, and practices impacting your needs in observability? Right. Okay. So this is a good one. Microservices are great. <laughs> microservices give you decoupling. So therefore teams can move independently and they reduce cognitive load on a team. So a team, and what that means in organization is you can get um, faster release cycles and faster, more innovation out of your teams. Whereas with a monolith, you're kind of stuck and you have to almost go waterfall and things are slower to release. Um, uh, and aside from that, in, with a, in theory, with microservices, you have more stability because the smaller things in the auto heal and the self heal. And with a monolith, the, you know, there's more to everything goes, if one part of the monolith goes wrong, chances are the whole monolith is going to fall down. Yeah. The thing with a monolith is if something goes wrong or you just want to check something, so it doesn't always have to be that something's wrong. You just want to see you know, how many transactions are going through. You go to one place, right? Yeah. So you, it's very easy to make a monolith 
observable. With microservices or you know smaller services or service oriented architecture or um, or lots of lambdas everywhere, I call I call that Pico services. I think lambda, it's microservices on steroids. Um, Pico services, great, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nano services maybe Pico services. Yeah. Um, your stuff's all over the place. So now to see the behavior, there's, there's two things you have to see. One is the behavior of any particular component. You have to go all over the place to find it. The other is how the components affect each other as well. So there's this collective observability that you have to do that you didn't have to do with a monolith. And then also the stuff's all over the place. So your observability game has to go through the roof. So um, I often say to a lot of people is don't do microservices unless you're, you know, you're willing to invest in your observability and your deployment as well, right? Um, and your your durability, your availability. You've got to get all those things right as well. Um, so microservices are great, but they're not for the faint of heart. Basically. <laughs> um, yeah. You've from really got it. Perspective, I think also from uh, general DevOps, you know, the the uh, management and orchestration of it, and uh, so it, it it's it's a it's a it's a very uh, flexible architecture, but uh, not every organization needs this sort of flexibility. And it comes with the cost. It comes with the cost of uh, skill set of the people. It comes with the cost of using frameworks that are much less mature and established than the traditional, you know, VM-based uh, stack that has been around for uh, for ages and, and so on. So, um, and obviously, specifically in observability, again, you to, to and, and security, you're also a DevSecOps guy. So securing, uh, you know, uh, containerized workloads, again, it's a new domain that you have much less uh, uh, tool set and less mature, obviously. And, and so uh, it's definitely consideration from what I've seen, but interesting uh, to see that. We have actually a, an interesting question also from the uh, from our listeners. Um, do you think a, a direct correlation between organization product and observability level exists? So um, it's an interesting question, right? Um, and, and we've seen this here at The Economist because when I first joined, our product function was quite weak. And now it's super. We've, we've hired a, um, a chief product officer who really, you know, from MS, and we poached him from MSNBC, and he's really made such a huge difference, really given us like a direction of travel. Why, what, what are we building? Why are we building? Um, and created this... Um, clarity of thought and we've actually done we've actually gone whole hog and we're going into stream aligned teams around so i can't take credit for this this is you know um product and, and the rest of my colleagues doing this but um they've created the teams around with a before our team, internal teams were a bit more nebulous sort of there's a, there's a team here that does kind of back endy stuff and a team here that is you know this now it's like the teams are aligned with the product um and now that we have that, then, then my function is, oh, okay, um, this team is working on the mobile app and 70% of our usage, I don't know the actual number, is now through the mobile app. Um, so we need to make sure that our observability on that is really high because more of our customers interface with that. Whereas this team here, they're doing the data platform and their observability um, and durability and availability doesn't have to be as mature. So um, from one perspective, having like a really good product function has made my life easier in answering, you know, the question, how much observability is enough? I've, you know, sort of, I can let go of the gas on, on, on that team and really put the gas down on this team. You need to really, we need to make sure that you're hundred percent coverage with, uh, APM. Uh, we need to make sure you're logging all the time and then set up triggers on that. And you're parsing the logs. You don't just dump text logs in. Can we actually parse the logs? Can we send in JSON, that kind of thing? So that's um definitely made life more my life easier you know otherwise devsecops as such isn't isn't really that involved from a product perspective uh, and then the next evolution of that is when you have sre and sre for me is when you can have those conversations with product and the, and the, the conversations around service level objective and you get product to also own it so product just say i want this app right and with the SRE, you can say, oh, you want this app, but how? what's the availability on it? What about the freshness of content? How how good does the app have to be? And you can actually start having those conversations. And then those inform how much observability you need. Because they say, oh, um, 
the the system's got to be up 24 seven, you know, nine, four nines of availability. You need to make sure that you've got enough observability to be able to do that. So that's like the next, hopefully level four, I call it uh, SRE. Um, and then that's when the back end can actually talk to, to product and have a, have a meaningful conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, and organization observability is just it's just overall maturity, right? Is if um, you're just into cloud and you're just starting out and you're a small company or you know you haven't got much uh, technical experience in building things. Back to your point, you're probably better off with a few monoliths than microservices. Build up your culture, build up your maturity, and then start doing microservices because you'll have if if your product is successful so you've started off with a monolith and your product is, is successful and starts falling over and you start having issues and you start you can't release as often actually then is the time to go into to microservices but you've already built up a base level of maturity and you know what the problems are but sometimes if you go straight in going back to your question now you sometimes you go straight back into microservices to start off with uh and you've got a whole suite of problems and you necessarily haven't solved the business problem um yeah. So, I think what, what you said, it, got, it ties back to uh, both on, on this point and in others that you need to have a, a thorough understanding of, of your organization, obviously not just uh, the technical and technological stack, but also the organization, the skill set, the processes and, and the needs ultimately, and then to match them and, and to see what, what kinds of uh, general DevOps practices, architecture and, and specifically observability. So how, how would you... Do you have any best practices on how to approach this uh, assessment on, on uh, understanding this preliminary research? Because many, I, my, my experience, many skip that stage and go straight to choosing their observability solution, uh, focusing very much heavily on, on the tools. And because of the lack of research and because everyone wants to be safe, they they err to the to the conservative side and and find themselves uh, with with uh, over again over provisioning too heavy a stack that needs too many people to maintain that is uh, not always justified with what they need. So how do you, uh, from your experience with the economists and the previous organizations that you've done, how do you address this uh, assessment, this research that guides you later on to how which observability is needed? Um. So observability has to be easy, right? Um, that's that's one metric. So you you don't you don't pick a complicated observability solution that needs lots of training to manage. So um, you know, and I'm not a fan of proprietary systems for that for, for that reason. Um, if you can't answer a question, or you can't ask a question of your observability platform, if you can't ask a question of your data, then either you've implemented it wrong, or it's the wrong approach, or it's the wrong tool. So that's that's the first thing. How do I assess? Um, so we, we've uh, we've set up uh, enablement teams, and we've been doing it for a while. We're we're just sort of doing a refresh and rebranding them. But an enablement team, again, with streamlined teams, um, it's from it's from the book um, the Team Topologies. So again, uh, hopefully, link it in the show notes. Um, very very good book, especially chapter three. It's blown my mind. Um, and we have, so when I first set up the DevOps team, it was a DevOps silo when I first came, mostly contractors. Um, so basically it was just an ops team, an ops team with cloud certifications, basically that's what they were. So it was no, no, it wasn't really DevOps, right? Um, and what I did was I kept the team, the DevOps team, and then I hired more people. We needed more people into it. And I hired software engineers into that DevOps team. And then I kept it as a, as a team, as an anti-pattern for a period of time, because they needed an identity to co coalesce around and learn all the cloud skills and the CICD and all the principles, because um, they're all software engineers and they didn't really have um, an ops background. Then once they were sort of skilled enough, dissolved them into the teams and then they fade into the teams and they went into the streamlined teams of software engineers with a sort of, with all the DevOps principles embedded in them. But so that's great. Now what we have is, an enablement team. So the next phase was a small team of crack engineers who go to all the other teams and say, do you need what, what DevOps kind of stuff do you need help with? And they, they jump in, they augment the team's capacity to help with their velocity and get the thing done. Right. So you need, uh, you need your logs turning from plain text into JSON so they can be parsed. And so they'll jump in with that team. 
that team is the one doing the assessments and that team is going to another and asking them what what pain points do you have what what are you struggling with and then they ask the team and then they find out the right solution for that team and yes we've got a centralized set of tools so often it gets shoehorned into that but they're the ones asking the the question um what is enough How, where do we start with um and how we do that, we like the levels of observability, durability, security, and so on from each and every one of these uh, respective uh, business units or, or teams or products, right? And we and we do that mostly through pairing. So we should we're talking about we, we're talking about a questionnaire that maybe we can give people out. I, I don't. I, I'm not really keen on that. I don't think. I don't. We can give questionnaires, but. Often a lot of people don't necessarily know what it is that they want or they need. They don't know what the final solution could be. They don't know the art of the possible, which is why I prefer interviewing people and asking them pointed questions and asking them about, A, what they want. But then also then you've got to be realistic about what we can afford and what we can do in the amount of time, either money or time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in a roundabout way, I've kind of tried to answer your question. And the, uh, the way I do that is, is by interviewing and asking, um, what is it you're trying to achieve? why why are you doing that why do you think you need this um when actually what you need is this is a, a typical software engineering stuff right you know um i don't think, i don't see it's any different to normal software engineering questions you want why do you want this actually what you want is this don't come to us with solutions come to us with your problems and we'll tell you what the solutions are i, I it's just uh yeah it's no different to normal software engineering in, in that sense um we yeah, always try and always try and discourage too you know too much turning on all the tools as well and then the tools aren't being used and we've we're guilty of this right and i'm guilty of this you buy the tools because nothing shot i get i love tools right so i get so excited and i watch all the demos and then i get wowed by the sales people you know and you're either lunch and... google uh, latest uh, blog post <laughs> about uh, how yeah. we shiny it is and uh, yeah and, and i i i'm like a magpie i get attracted to it straight so i'm i'm totally guilty of this right and i'm, I'm learning my lesson now um is you don't, don't just buy a tool for the sake of it and we, we've done that we've got tools for the sake. i won't name them and they're amazing tools but they're not being implemented so what's the point of the tool that's exactly. another anti-pattern that i see and, and i'm guilty of myself right um so but i haven't done it i haven't done it for about the last year or so so i think i've learned my lesson um when you buy a tool you also need to have the capacity to be able to integrate that tool. And you've got to factor that in to when you're buying a tool. Don't just buy a tool on their website because, you know, you see the pain points on the things on the questions on the website. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this problem? You say, yes, I'll buy this tool and it's going to solve your problem. It won't. <laughs> you still need you still need that tool integrating in. You still need that tool to be used. You still need training on that tool. And that's definitely one thing I've learned in the last, last year or two is... Whenever you buy a tool, make sure you got the people to implement and the time to implement them as well. Yeah, I think that that's what um, I found interesting in our you know uh, earlier conversations. The practical way that you uh, you take uh, in, in in approaching that, and this is uh, again goes goes back to the thing that people follow the the the, the shiniest and the, the the hottest trend and the hype and uh, but making a proper uh, assessment and understanding what your needs are and then just deriving the the minimum set that will satisfy these needs and not more it's something that is is harder uh, said than uh, done, uh, easier said than done um, and also uh, understanding the, the investment that is involved because again the, the tool pricing and licensing is one thing but there's the, the, the headcount that you need suddenly to designate specifically for maintaining and uh, uh, ramping up around that uh, different skill set in the organization and, uh, um, and, and uh, the, the other aspects. So maybe uh, can you say anything about how you estimate the investment when you come to management uh, saying we need to go down this path? How do you approach uh, assessing the investment, the overall, including headcount and skill set and beyond ramp up also general maintenance that is ongoing uh, around the observability stack um 
because because we mapped our individuals teams we've already done the mapping process and you know um and have a look at the matrix so we know where each team is we um and again are we not having those sre type conversations with product yet so we haven't got to that level of maturity parts of the organization have and and i've certainly my my, my department has not been able to successful at that so um that would definitely help, right? Because then we're not just asking the engineers, we're also asking product what they expect as well. And then we can say to the engineers, hold on, they're asking for this. You, you, you're you, probably going to need this, right? So that would be the next level of maturity. But So if we ignore product for the moment and talk about engineering. Um, so uh, the, first of all, you POC the tool and then you work out, you know, what it is to, how, how long it takes to integrate. Will it work with, you know, what, what will it take to integrate in, in a couple of POCs in different languages as well, right? Because we use various languages across the estate. So you've got to make sure, and deployment methods as well. So there's, uh, in our example, is bit Beanstalk. Uh, um, there's yeah, some ECS, Fargate, Lambda, you know, um, just traditional EC2. So you've got, to, you've got to work out what it takes to integrate with those different use cases. Once you know that, then you can say how, then when you go to an engineering team and you, and they, you look at their systems and the things they're working with, then you can say, that's going to take a day. That's going to take two. That's going to take two weeks. Oh, we've never done that before. We're going to have to spike. Will it even work? Then you can make your estimates. So I think that that POC stage is super important. You've got to have. The, it's the other thing. You've got to have time to do that POC. And I've been guilty of this as well. You, they turn on the trial and give it to you, um, and then you've not earmarked enough engineering capacity to actually do those experiments across your team. So yeah, no, know, know what's across your estate. Um, look at the different technologies. So that's deployment technologies as well as um, uh, programming languages and platforms, um, and also you know your security posture as well. Like, can you shift? Can you set in PII from that or not? You know what? What kind of data do we have to hide or that kind of thing? Know that, then POC against each of them, or at least a, a good subset of them. Then you can make the estimate on how long it'll take to integrate and make a plan. Um, so we bind this tool and we're going to need a hundred hours of engineering capacity to, to, to integrate it, for example. Um, that's how systematic. And the thing is, is now we are buying fewer tools. We've actually got rid of a lot of tools and let the contract lapse. And where well, lots of tools that weren't even used, like only two teams are utilizing it or it's poor, even then when they've, in, they've just done the basic integration and there's no, they're not getting any value out of it. So I, I'm definitely of the mindset now, fewer tools, but well integrated is going to give you more observability, more value than, you know, buying all the shiny tools. Um, and then they're just not telling you anything because you haven't worked with them. Yeah, it's part of the uh, maturity, I think, that, again, I see that in many organizations. Again, I, I've been guilty of that myself, that uh, in, in some point you realize that you've accumulated way too many uh, tools and... Uh, uh, certainly not uh, ideal coverage that what you actually need and a uh, fewer but focused and where you want to build the skill set rather than you know spread thin is something that I think comes with uh, realization that comes with the maturity so uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it is I often talked about in terms of unit testing and, and code coverage right so um, you can go for a hundred percent coverage so you say to a team you got to have hundred percent unit test coverage right? And every time I've said that to a team, they've come back and 100%, we've got 100% coverage. And then you look at the tests and they're just like very superficial. They don't really tell you anything meaningful. They're not really testing the core of the nub of the system. Right. And you just say to a team, when you go to a team and you say, we want really comprehensive co coverage on the most important, uh, you know, I'm talking about web systems now, routes in this system or the most important models, the most important functions in this system like really make sure they're tested the functions that are getting called a lot, make sure they have super coverage, the functions that change a lot, make sure they have really good tests, comprehensive um, to give you confidence. So it's not about the test coverage number at the end. It's more about you as an engineer, you got confidence, you made a change and nothing's going to break. Once, yeah. you, If you say that to an engineering team, you end up with really meaningful tests that are going to provide a lot of value. Um, and it's the same, it's the same with, tools um, observability you know in this case by the way we have an need. yeah we had an interesting episode uh, here in open observability i interviewed uh, uh, about microservices and, and actually applying uh, uh, methodology of observability in general and, and 
uh, tracing in particular for pre-production for the design phase in a way of focusing your testing, for example, uh, and your analysis on the critical paths from your production. So as you said, you can't do 100% uh, coverage. So focus, if, if the system is already in production, you know where the most of the invocations go, which down these, which paths, which paths are more critical or sensitive. And, and then you can you cover it, base, cover, base your coverage based on what actually goes on in production. So that it's actually interesting to hear what you're saying now. It uh, echoes very with the same ideas. Yeah, and in, in security, we call that we call that threat modeling. So, um, and, and again, the you have a constraint. You only have X amount of engineering capacity, 100 hours, 200 hours, 10 hours, whatever it is that you've got. And you've got these 100 risks, right? So the, the, your uh, node is out of date, your Python's old, your old version of Linux, uh, open, open security groups, open firewalls, that kind of thing, right? So you've got this amount of engineering capacity, X amount of engineering capacity, and Y amount, and it's always 10 times. Y is always at least 10 times bigger than X, right? So you have way more problems than you have capacity to fix. So what you do is you threat model and you look at the things that are potentially going to, you look at the attacks out there, you look at the things that are going to hurt you the most and you fix those things first. So it's the same in security, same in unit testing, and it's the same with tooling and, and sort of DevOps and observability. If you can cover your critical path, I, I like that term, right? If you cover your critical path, the things that matter the most and have really high confidence in those. How you measure confidence, I don't know, right? But high yeah. confidence in those um, conceptually, right? You, you're very confident about those parts of the system. You have confidence it's going to stay up. You have confidence that is highly accurate. You have confidence that you can make changes and release them quickly if you have confidence in those kinds of things. Then... Yeah, it's better to do aim small, miss small, get those things right, get your tooling on that right. And then, you know, um, we'll worry about the less later. And you might find that you don't even need to bother with the rest. Just keep observing in the core. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I see another question from the uh, from the audience here. Uh, with the acceleration in DevOps and observability over the last 12 to 24 months, what's the current uh, shiniest tool? So <laughs> listeners still are interested in the shiniest tools, although we try to preach, focus on what matters best, but uh, go ahead and take your uh, this one. Yeah, no, uh, the thing I, I like the most um, is tools that integrate, and it's, it's a new breed of tools, right? They integrate into Linux's eBPF filters so they can give you observability on the Linux processes, right, and what the Linux processes are doing. Um, and then they aggregate that into a large tool and a lovely platform. And, and I'm trying to think of the one. I should know what it is. My friend, my friend works for them. I'm just going to look. One of the one of the uh, um, one of those tools. I won't mention the name because well, can I mention the name? Unless it's an open source. No, I'm just, just kidding. Yeah, go ahead. It's well, it, they, they are open source based. Actually, no, they are. They are. Um, so bear, bear with me. Let me just uh, um, let me just look at Chris's name. Chris's company, rather. Yes, yeah, so the tools, um, I think, it's been around for a while, but Sysdig, tools like Sysdig, I think, are the new shiny, where they they plug in, basically, they plug into, we won't talk too about the mechanics, but they plug into the Linux kernel, and they can see at the kernel level the function calls and the sys calls that are happening. Um, I think those things are very excited from an from observability perspective. And also from a security perspective as well, because then we start looking for things that shouldn't be happening and, and alerting on those. So um, that's the shiniest tool. I've resisted buying it because <laughs> I know we don't have the capacity to implement it. Yeah. And so um, the, my sensible brain has kicked in. My, my, my child brain is like, oh, I want this tool. I want this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> um, but my, my sensible brain is we still haven't you know, got full full whack out of our, uh, we haven't got full value out of our APM tool. We haven't got full value of our logging tools. So um, let's get those in first. Those are going to give you, once we've done those properly, we're going to get so much value out of those. Then we'll talk about the shiny level four, level five stuff, right? But yeah. let's get to let's get to level three first and, and be happy there. Yeah, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned them because uh, um, Sysdig is, uh, for, for the audience uh, who doesn't know, uh, they're also the company behind uh, Falco, uh, which is an open source uh, under the CNCF. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the security for uh, containerized uh, workloads, a very, very interesting uh, uh, 
a project in the open source community. I think we may have uh, discussed that in previous episodes. And actually, uh, now they've released uh, another piece into contributed into the CNCF. So for uh, mentioning a piece of news, <laughs> but uh, uh, around the, uh, the they donated the e the eBPF uh, and the drivers for uh, the the, li the uh, or the libraries for Linux. Uh, to the CNCF, so it's, it's actually uh, very interesting. I've been uh, involved with that, and also uh, Logs.io is uh, one of the adopters of, uh, of the Falco project, so uh, it's a very interesting uh, news that uh, I hope will uh, contribute well for the uh, CNCF and for the ecosystem in general, so uh, thanks for bringing this up as well. Um, well, I think we're about to uh, run out of time. So, um, any any last thoughts and uh, uh, pointers that you want to uh, give us, uh, concluding the, your your uh, best practices on the on this topic? Yeah. So, so the other one, and again, um, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes, is is around um, observability tooling and understanding which tools are best for which layer of your system. I think a lot of people get confused. They say, okay, we've got we've got logging now and that's it. We've got observability or we've got APM, you know, we've bought new relic or we've bought Datadog or we've bought um, some of the new upstarts out there and uh, that's it. Our observability is done, yeah. but um, we talk about what parts of the system are you observing? So uh, you got APM. Great. So you can look at your server side code and you can see which functions are being called, which database calls are happening. But what about the server and the, the stuff underneath? So the server that it's running on, right? Okay, so then we've got CloudWatch. Um, great answering that. Then what about your API responses? Who's monitoring those? And then there's tooling there that monitors, monitors that. And then there's, well, what about the endpoints? Who's monitoring those? So they think, oh, tools like, you know, Pingdom and things like that and, and CatchPoint, and they monitor those. And um, what about error handling? And the interesting thing about logging is it tends to, not the server is it covers it kind of goes traverses through all of them so you can get logging is one of those things that gives you answers at maybe not the front end level but definitely the entire stack it goes horizontally across the entire stack so i've got a, a little it's called the observability strategy and you can see how logging goes across those so logging is one of those things that gives you many answers to many parts of the system and really going back to talking about how things intersect and, and you should, in a Venn diagram, you've got your APM tool, you've got your CloudWatch tool, your server monitoring tool, um, and then you've got your logging. In the center is where the truth will be. So, um, you know, back to your question, you know, earlier is like focus on logging first. That's one of the things I think adds a huge amount of value later. But again, do it properly, right? Don't just shift it and text logs. That's it. Ticket done, Jira ticket closed, boom. We've done logging make sure that you know it's in a way that's queryable um, and you've done it properly and you've not done a point to point integration using a proper sidecar that whole kind of nine yards and then really start doing then do the work on the queries and getting value out of those logs um, so that's uh, that's one of the things like understanding what role different observability tools have in your in your estate right uh, yeah amen to that uh, definitely something we've been preaching for a long time and uh, good hearing more uh, more members of the community uh, uh, evangelizing on this topic because it's definitely a part of the signs of maturity in the uh, in this domain. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Jujo, for uh, joining uh, today the episode. It was a really, really interesting, uh, fascinating talk and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the links to uh, share with the uh, with the people afterwards because they're also very useful. Uh, read out to uh, follow up on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs> and now it's time for some industry news and uh, updates. Let me uh, bring up some of the interesting uh, uh, pointers here. Um, I'll just uh, share them over so you can uh, see my screen. Let's share here. This again. Uh, here we go. And going over to the news. 
Sorry about that. So the first piece uh, is actually a follow-up on uh, um, the last episode. We mentioned that um, uh, essentially uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana are going off uh, open source, uh, and it's uh, created uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, discussion in the uh, community around that. So um, the current stance on that is that uh, AWS, as we mentioned uh, last month, uh, has been uh, 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 taking this challenge and uh, uh, wrapping uh, a fork around that uh, in collaboration with uh, other members of the industry. Uh, this has been going on for the past uh, month or so, and uh, with uh, quite an impressive, uh, impressive uh, progress, especially given the uh, intertwined code base there between the open source and the uh, non-open source within the, uh, this project. So uh, as per uh, last update, this is an update that you can see from uh, uh, about a week ago. Uh, so it, it talks about a 93% uh, done. I think since then it's been uh, it's progressed to 95 or 98% done. So it's uh, pretty impressive, both on the uh, Cabana fork and the um, uh, Elasticsearch fork. Um, I think the slowest one, as you can see, is the CI, the continuous integration that uh, needed to be uh, reworked. But other things like the XPA code uh, removed, the uh, licensing tools and checks eliminated, telemetry collection eliminated and the uh, test framework and updates uh, nearly done. Uh, there are some uh, still legal uh, issues and the, the branding. Uh, so uh, this uh, slows down the, the last mile, but certainly uh, close to uh, uh, wrapping up. Uh, we also see some uh, more community members involved in this week's uh, uh, weekly um, uh, meetup. Uh, there was a talk by uh, Logs.io's CTO, uh, Jonah Cowell, was talking about uh, contributions that uh, Logs.io have been working on and looking forward to uh, 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 adding to the fork once it's uh, uh, released and, and uh, in, in good shape. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, call out to all the community members. Uh, I'm using this stage also to reach out to uh, everyone here that's interested in uh, contributing. Uh, also uh, participating in the meetups, there'll be more open for more uh, people to talk and to uh, uh, discuss topics, contributions, and others. So uh, if, you are, if you are interested, look at the uh, open distro for Elasticsearch uh, uh, forum and uh, suggest your uh, topics. Uh, it will not stay, by the way, under the open uh, distro. It will be an independent activity, but currently uh, hosted uh, uh, there. Uh, so this is an interesting, uh, interesting update on that. Another uh, interesting piece of news that I wanted to share with you, uh, a second here, is around uh, open telemetry. A uh, very important milestone. Open telemetry has reached um, uh, the uh, version 1.0 on the uh, tracing, distributed tracing side. This is an important milestone. And now, after it's no longer experimental, and uh, uh, in this respect, we can see already some guarantees, uh, talking about uh, a three-year support guarantee for the APIs, one-year support guarantee for the uh, uh, plugin interfaces and the constructor. So now there's uh, something <clears throat> more solid that uh, organizations can uh, bank on when uh, implementing based on that. It is important, however, to mention that this is just the first stage, open telemetry, as we've discussed also in previous episodes. Uh, aims to, to address also logging and metrics. So metrics are still um, um, uh, in the works. Uh, logging is even one step uh, behind, but uh, it is something that is uh, being worked on. And also in terms of uh, uh, distributed tracing, uh, different uh, uh, programming languages that are being supported, each one with its own uh, uh, progression. The most advanced ones uh, you can see here, Erlang, uh, Java, .NET, Python that are uh, advanced uh, release candidates that are considered uh, uh, solid uh, for implementing and more languages to come. So this is a good uh, piece of news for the open telemetry and a different, very, very important uh, milestone to, uh, to note. Um, another um, interesting piece of news around open telemetry on the logging side is a very important contribution by uh, Stanza. Uh, uh, contributing their logging agent to open telemetry that's the from the github of uh, open telemetry uh, community accepting this uh, contribution um, 
one of the advantages of this is that uh, Stanza's agent is uh, written in Go, so uh, it's a good match for integrating into the uh, OpenTelemetry collector, which is uh, uh, Go-based as well. And um, you know, the idea would be to provide um, you know uh, all the receivers for the different um, uh, formats uh, supporting uh, log ingestion with uh, uh, file tailing, Windows events log, uh, journal ID, syslog, and so on and so forth. So having the flexibility um, uh, with the parsing packages, uh, this is another important milestone there. Uh, another something interesting that uh, uh, occurred in the industry is a contribution uh, by Docker of the Docker distribution to uh, the CNCF. That's um, actually, um, um, you may say, in, in reaction to uh, what uh, took place back in December when uh, Kubernetes uh, decided to um, uh, deprecate uh, uh, Docker and essentially um, uh, take uh, starting uh, version uh, 1.20, which is the version that has been released uh, about a month ago and uh, align with the uh, standard uh, uh, CRI, the container runtime uh, interface uh, that uh, Kubernetes has been, and the community has been encouraging. Uh, Docker hasn't supported that, so uh, that was the, the conflict there. Um, and I guess Docker realized that uh, this may very well uh, uh, render them irrelevant. So this is an important move in, in keeping Docker in the picture and actually bring them closer. Docker has been, you know, the, the the forefront of the uh, of the container uh, uh, movement and the containerization. So it is a, a significant player, and the rich, uh, you know, uh, availability of, of uh, images and uh, uh, content there around Docker is something that is is not negligible by any by any means. Um, and by the way, uh, Docker uh, produced images are supposed to be still uh, compatible with Kubernetes. So uh, it's not that uh, the deprecation means that you can't use that, but uh, I think now that Docker uh, is becoming part of the CNCF, we'll uh, uh, revamp the engagement between uh, Docker and Kubernetes and uh, create the ecosystem in a more holistic uh, way around that. So that's uh, also something very interesting for uh, um, uh, from the past uh, uh, news. And um, uh, that's just to show you that the announcement from December, I kept it here so that you can see uh, Kubernetes announcing, uh, deprecating it in favor of uh, runtime that use the CRI. So um, um, it is uh, something that is uh, in heavy debate within the uh, CNCF community and definitely looking forward to uh, to that. Uh, we are about to run out of time, so um, um, we'll uh, set aside with these news for uh, for today. And uh, with that, I would like to um, uh, conclude and uh, uh, thank you uh, all for joining us. Obviously, thanking Jujar Singh for uh, uh, having this very, very interesting episode. Uh, all the episodes, as always, uh, are available on the uh, on your favorite podcast app, so uh, you can look it there, or uh, um, or on YouTube. So also available on demand on YouTube after the live uh, stream. Uh, usually, we typically have the uh, the episodes uh, live streamed uh, on the last Thursday of the month, so uh, you can uh, join the live stream on, on Twitch or on uh, YouTube Live if you. Uh, want to present your own uh, questions or you know ask me anything or uh, comments on the topics in a live stream uh, you can find all the details uh, at openobservability.io uh, website and do follow us also uh, on twitter uh, at openobserve for uh, updates to share your comments suggestions uh, news bits We're always looking for interesting news to share with the community I'm uh, Dotan Horovitz, uh, so you can find me at Horovitz, H-O-R-O-V-I-T-S. And uh, last but not least, uh, if you are interested in participating, if you have something interesting that you would like to talk about and contribute from your experience, do uh, share, reach out. Uh, you can uh, post your uh, topic suggestion uh, on openobservability.io. Or again, you can reach out to me on over Twitter or OpenObserve or whichever way works for you. We definitely would like to uh, have you and uh, get more members involved. Uh, so I was Dotan Horvitz. 
Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to uh, seeing you in next month's episode.